light gathering organs all in a, a little crystalline array. The histology of the eyes uh, is quite different. Single light gathering lens for the mammalian eye and this array of uh, independent little light gathering units in the compound eye of insect. Although those eyes look very different, it turns out that the same toolkit gene is required for eye development in many different organisms. So this gene is called PAX6. If you make a mutation in one chromosome, the one of the two copies of PAX6 uh, during human development, you begin to lose uh, particular parts of the eye, in particular the colored uh, iris muscle that normally surrounds the pupil. So you can see there the eye of a, a patient with a uh, defect in one copy of his PAX6 gene, and that produces uh, the absence of an iris, a, a disease called aniridia, so the pupil now nearly fills the eye. Similarly, in the mouse, mutation in one of the two copies of the PAX6 gene partially reduces uh, the size of the eye. Mutations in both copies completely eliminate the eye, the uh, mouse uh, embryo head shown at the upper right. Although Drosophila eyes look very different than mammalian eyes, there's a similar PAX6 gene in fruit flies, and if you make a mutation in that gene, you eliminate the compound eye of the, the fruit fly. Even more remarkably, if you overexpress this key uh, developmental regulator of eye formation, you can generate new eye tissue in completely different body parts. So this is an experiment that was done uh, by uh, Walter Gehring's lab, taking this PAX6 gene and engineering it to be expressed uh, during leg development in a uh, developing fruit fly. You can see when you overexpress uh, the eye regulator gene, you induce on the leg of the fruit fly a tiny little patch of red compound eye tissue. If you do a scanning electron micrograph, that structure has exactly the kind of independent repeated uh, eye unit that you would find in the normal fly eye. And remarkably, you can get that result whether you do the experiment with the fly pack 6 gene or with a pack 6 gene from mice. So we think that genes like PAX6 are part of an ancient toolkit that's been inherited from a common ancestor and can be put to work to build related structures, even uh, in very different looking animals. So how do these sorts of uh, master regulators work? Well, many of the ancient uh, toolkit genes that control the development of the AP body axis or the formation of a particular tissue turn out to encode gene products that act by switching other genes on and off. Okay, so for example, to build an eye, you have to express uh, lens proteins and photoreceptors. What the PAX6 gene does is it acts as a regulatory molecule that flips switches on target genes and causes things like lens proteins and photoreceptors uh, to be expressed at the site where the PAX6 gene is expressed. So we have a short video uh, to show that kind of uh, regulatory structure. So this is a gene with the yellow part uh, of the DNA, uh, the coding part colored yellow. That might encode something like a lens protein. It would normally only be expressed if an RNA polymerase lands on the gene's promoter and makes a messenger RNA from the gene. The coding region of the gene is surrounded by a series of regulatory switches. So these are parts of DNA that don't code for any protein. Instead, they act as switches that determine where and when the gene turns on. Those switches are the landing sites for regulatory molecules that bind to the switches, recruit DNA polymerase to the gene's promoter, and cause an increase in the total number of messenger RNA transcripts that's coming from the gene. So typically, a gene will be surrounded by multiple uh, switches. That allows the gene to be turned on at different times and places uh, under the control of different signals and regulatory molecules. A lens protein in the mouse is also expressed in the liver, for example. It might have a switch where a regulatory molecule turns it on in the eye lens. The PAX6 gene is an example of a regulatory molecule that would bind to one of those switches. There'd be a different switch uh, for turning the gene on uh, in the liver. Okay, with that background on master regulators, uh, let's come back uh, to the problem of forelimb and hindlimb uh, development in different animals. Forelimbs or hindlimbs are good examples of structures that vary in different uh, ways along the anterior posterior body axis. So forelimbs and hindlimbs can become wings or legs, short legs so in the hopping legs, uh, spines and fins uh, in fish. All vertebrates share Another set of toolkit uh, master regulatory genes that are involved in controlling the formation 
of hind limbs or forelimb. So these uh, slides show a series of chick embryos that have been stained uh, with a blue dye. This is a method that allows you to look at where an individual gene is being expressed. So you see sites of blue at the sites where the gene is normally turning on. There's a gene called TBX5 that's expressed in the wing bud of a chick, but not the leg. There's another gene called TBX4 that's expressed in the hind uh, leg, but not the wing. There's another gene called PIDX1 that turns on in the leg, but not the wing. So all vertebrates uh, have these master regulatory genes that are expressed in one limb or the other and help determine uh, how the limbs normally form. Doesn't matter whether you're a fish or a frog or a chick uh, or a mouse, uh, these genes are turning on in uh, one limb structure or the other. So what's happened in organisms where the development of one limb has been drastically altered? So we went through yesterday the example of completely losing the hind limb uh, in natural populations of sticklebacks. And I summarized a series of uh, genetic experiments that showed that a major gene located at the distal end of linkage group 7 controls the presence or the absence of the pelvis uh, in these natural populations. So it's possible to actually uh, also determine the location of these toolkit master regulators that are known to be involved in hind limb or forelimb development. And when you do that, it turns out that one of the hind limb master regulators maps exactly to the locus that controls the presence or absence of the hind fin uh, in the stickleback. That gene is called the PIDX1 gene, the one uh, I showed you on the earlier expression slides as well. This gene actually plays several different roles uh, during normal development. You may wonder why it's called PIDX1. Well, in addition uh, to normally turning on in hind limbs but not forelimbs, it also turns on in some other body tissues. It turns on in the pituitary and plays an important role in controlling pituitary gene expression. It also turns on in uh, jaws and mouth parts. If you completely eliminate the PIDX1 gene in a mouse, you shrink the hind limb but the mouse dies at birth with pituitary abnormalities and, uh, and jaw abnormalities, craniofacial defects. Now, in some ways, that doesn't look very promising for trying to use this gene to evolve a new structure in uh, populations that are subject to a full range of fitness constraints in the wild. On the other hand, if you look at what's happened to the PIDX1 gene uh, in sticklebacks, the protein coding region of the gene has not changed at all in marine and pelvic reduced sticklebacks. In contrast, if you look at where this toolkit gene is normally expressed in embryos, there is an obvious difference in PIDX1 expression. So now we're seeing blue at those sites where the PIDX1 gene is expressed in either a marine or a pelvic reduced population. You can see in the marine population expression in the blue mouth and jaw regions. It also turns on in a spot uh, at the side of the body where the hind fin would normally grow out. You also see that from the belly of the fish uh, here in the lower left. Uh, with two spots where the hind limbs would normally form. In the pelvic reduced population, you still have normal expression in the developing head region, the mouth and the jaw parts, but at the site in the body where the hind limb would normally form, the PIDX1 gene uh, normally no longer turns on uh, in that location. So what do we think is happening? Uh, that's summarized uh, in the final brief animation. Both the marine and the pelvic reduced population have a PIDX1 locus. The coding region of the gene is still intact in both populations. This gene, we think, is surrounded by a series of these regulatory switches that cause it to turn on in specific body parts, like the jaw or the pituitary or the hind limb. In both populations, some of those switches are still present and function normally. So the genes express normally in the mouth parts. You still build normal mouths and jaws in both populations still expressed in the pituitary, you still form a normal pituitary uh, in both organisms. In the marine population, it turns on in the hind limb and you build the pelvis. In the reduced population, the hind limb control switch has been inactivated. You no longer express the PIDX1 gene at that location, and as a result, the hind limb fails to form uh, in the fish. Okay, you'll hear from Sean that similar tweaking with these switches that surround genes provides a very flexible method for evolution to use to create major changes, morphological changes in particular body regions, but still preserve uh, the overall viability, the coding region, and the expression of the genes uh, in other tissues. Okay, 